My name is Dan Gold. I'm from Johns Hopkins. I'm a neurology trained neuroophthalmologist, um, neurovestibular specialist, and um, I tried to give this talk a couple of weeks ago. Um, there is an issue on my end, which I hope that I fixed. I just broadcast a talk via Zoom yesterday from Mexico down to Argentina, and it, it worked. All my videos worked, so I'm very confident. I'm going to show the same couple of slides. I only got through maybe a quarter of the presentation last time. I'm going to show them again uh, because it seems that the audio and the video, there was such a significant lag that just nothing I said probably made any sense. So my apologies for that. This is broken down into two separate PowerPoints, two parts. One is the, the bedside exam of the ocular motor system. The second is the vestibular system. Um, the two are sort of obviously are, are very much intertwined and go hand in hand. My presentations are just so large, the size of them, it's just easier to have two separate uh, presentations rather than one large three gigabyte PowerPoint presentation. So that's the reason. And I'll get started. So everything I show here um, and much more is available in my collection through the North American Neuroophthalmology Society. Um, this is part of the Neuroophthalmology Virtual Education Library. I have my own collection. This is free. Feel free to access it. Feel free to share it with your colleagues or whoever. Um, if you have any recommendations, things that, I sh that should be there, um, please don't hesitate to reach out and, and let me know how I can improve this collection. Okay, so for this part A talk, we're really just going to talk about the ocular motor system. Why is it important to do a comprehensive ocular motor exam to diagnose and localize uh, where the problem is? Is this central? Is this peripheral? What's going on? So how do you examine the ocular motor system? First, you have to know a little bit about the eye movement machinery, which mainly lives in um, the brainstem. The cerebellum mainly is responsible for sort of fine tuning of these movements. So we care about certain structures. These are the ones we care about the most. We care about the burst neurons, those neurons that generate saccades. To generate vertical and torsional saccades, not surprisingly, we're talking about a structure located in the midbrain. That's where the ocular motor um, nuclei are for vertical movements in the midbrain. So you'd want these structures to be close. This is the rostral interstitial medial longitudinal fasciculus, the RIMLF. Horizontally, the burst neurons are the paramedian pontine reticular formation or the PPRF, which again, not surprisingly, are in the pons. That's where the eye movement machinery lives that moves the eyes horizontally, um, the six nucleus. What about gaze holding? You make a saccade out to the right or out to the left or up or down, and you want the eyes to stay in that position. There has to be a mechanism to hold the eyes in that position um, the, to, to maintain proper gaze holding. Uh, vertically and torsionally, these live, again, not surprisingly, in the midbrain, the interstitial nucleus of Cajal, the INC. Horizontally, they live in the NPH mainly, the nucleus propositus hypoglossi, and the medial vestibular nucleus. These structures are mainly in the medulla, um, but very close to the six nuclei. What about the cerebellum? We care a lot about the flocculus and paraflocculus. These structures enhance gaze holding. Um, so that even if the INC and NPH are working perfectly well, if somebody has a cerebellar degeneration, commonly you're going to see gaze evoked nystagmus both horizontally and vertically because the flocculus isn't working. These structures play an important role in smooth pursuit. They also inhibit the anterior canal pathways. So if the anterior canal pathways can't be inhibited, you see a slow phase up and a fast phase down or this spontaneous downbeat nystagmus, which is very common in, in degenerative cerebellopathies. We care about um, the saccades. Not only do we wanna initiate saccades, but we wanna make sure they're accurate. This is mainly the job of these midline structures, the vestigial nucleus, the ocular motor vermis. What about the nodulus? This plays a significant role in velocity storage, which we'll talk a little bit about as well, um, as in addition to VOR adaptation. So how do we examine the eye or how do we examine the eye movements? What does a, a comprehensive uh, exam consist of? It consists of these elements, which we'll go through one by one. So first, the range of eye movements, fixation and gaze holding. You want to make sure that the patient looking straight ahead at a target, the eyes aren't moving, the patient can maintain fixation, the eyes are nice and quiet. You want to have the patient look 
up and down and left and right as far as they can to make sure that the eyes are moving normally. Um, while they're in that eccentric position, you want to see if there's any gaze evoked nystagmus. So having the patient look all the way up and to the left as I'm doing right now and up and to the right and to the right and up and down and left. Are the eyes jiggling? Is there any gaze evoked nystagmus? This patient has an abnormal range. A couple of clues as to the etiology here. Number one is that she's holding her eyelids up. She has severe ptosis. This is me asking her to make um, now vertical saccades and now horizontal saccades. The eyes aren't moving as far as they should. And as I continue to ask her to move the eyes, they're going slower and slower. They're fatiguing. So an abnormal range of movements. This patient has ophthalmoplegia. This patient has severe bilateral ptosis, which is aided by her holding her, her eyelids up. And this fatigues. This patient has myasthenia gravis as the explanation for her ophthalmoplegia. So remember that ophthalmoplegia can be supranuclear, as in the case of progressive supranuclear palsy, which um, you're affecting the, the rostral interstitial medial longitudinal vesiculus and other um, non-nuclear structures, mainly in the midbrain, um, over time, the eyes don't move as they should. You can have a nuclear problem that causes ophthalmoplegia. You can have uh, a stroke that involves the third nucleus or the sixth nucleus um, or the fourth nucleus. You can affect the fascicle, that is the fibers that are exiting the nucleus. You can affect the nerve itself as it exits the brainstem. The problem can be neuromuscular, as in this patient. The problem can be myopathic as well. And the reason that you care about um, the range of eye movements is because the range of eye movements, if it's limited, is really going to affect your ability to evaluate um, the other classes of eye movements and perform a, a, a complete, um, easy to interpret vestibular exam. These are examples of abnormal fixation. This patient has nystagmus. This nystagmus is known as jerk nystagmus. There's a fast phase, there's a slow phase, there's a fast phase. The slow phase um, is the culprit. The slow phase initiates the abnormal eye movement and the fast movement is the sort of position reset mechanism. This patient has spontaneous upbeat nystagmus from Wernicke's encephalopathy due to thymine deficiency. This is another form, the other form of nystagmus. This is pendular. And these are back to back to back slow phases. There's no fast phase. It looks like a pendulum. This is a patient who had oculopalatal tremor, which is a common cause of pendular nystagmus, in addition to a patient with acquired pendular nystagmus due to multiple sclerosis, for instance. This patient does not have nystagmus. This patient has a saccadic intrusion, these saccadic oscillations, um, where in this case, the saccade is the culprit. These very fast saccades, these are in any um, plane, vertical or horizontal, this patient has opsoclonus. And what happens is that all of a sudden you have these back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back saccades with no inter-saccadic interval. Um, this patient has opsoclonus. If this was only horizontal, this would be ocular flutter, but this is not nystagmus. This is an example of a saccadic intrusion, um, which is another um, eye movement abnormality that's going to impair the patient's ability to fixate. What about gaze holding? This patient has right beating and right gaze. Now I'm bringing back it, there's left, left beating in primary. Looking to the left, there's really significant left beating. Have the patient look back to center. Now there's right beating, that's rebound nystagmus. This is gaze evoked nystagmus, right beating and right gaze. Now there's left beating nystagmus. This is rebound nystagmus. So if you see pathologic gaze evoked nystagmus, commonly you will also see this rebound nystagmus. If you're not sure if a patient has a physiologic endpoint nystagmus versus pathologic gaze evoked nystagmus, if you see rebound nystagmus, then you can, you can rest assured that this is in fact pathologic. Also in this case, when she's looking out to the left, the, the amplitude of the movements is quite large. They don't fatigue. Um, all of these argue strongly for this being pathologic gaze of oak nystagmus. What about saccades? I like to evaluate saccades in a few different ways. Um, one is a, a lateral target or an eccentric target to my nose. Um, this allows you to really tell if the patient's saccades are accurate. 
Um, is the patient undershooting or overshooting your nose? Then I have the patient perform larger amplitude saccades. This is a nice way to, to evaluate for the velocity. Are these too slow? Also, conjugacy, are the eyes moving together? Is there an internuclear ophthalmoplegia? And again, you want to make sure that you're evaluating horizontally and vertically. And just, I just want to check, is, is the audio and the video sort of pretty, pretty close together? There's not a significant lag this time? No There's lag. There's no lag at all. No lag. Great. Perfect. Okay. So last time that was, that was, last time was entirely my fault. I apologize. All right. So um, we care about the latency as well and, and uh, different neurodegenerative conditions, for instance. You ask the patient to make a saccade and then a couple of seconds pass and they finally initiate the saccade. So accuracy, conjugacy, velocity, we talked about these. This is a patient with saccadic dysmetria. I have the patient look to the right and the eyes go too far and then there's a, a, a movement back to where the target is. So these are hypermetric to the right, and now to the left, they're hypometric. So there's a couple of little saccades to get to my nose, to get to the target. This is in slow motion, makes it easier to see. One, two, three. Three little hypometric saccades to get to my nose. So hypermetric to the right, hypometric to the left. Um, the most common cause of this is going to be a, a lateral medullary lesion, in this case was a stroke. The patient will overshoot or have hypermetric saccades in the direction of the lesion, if this is a lateral medullary, um, a Wallenberg syndrome as it was in this patient. And the dys dysmetric saccades can be highly localizing as in this case. Um, these, the saccade pathways, which I'm not going to go into, travel from the inferior olive through the inferior cerebellar peduncle via the climbing fibers to the dorsal vermis and the cerebellum and the vestigial nucleus. And this loop, this circuit um, can, when interrupted, when there's imbalance, can cause hypermetric saccades in one direction, hypo in the other. If the patient has hypermetric saccades in both directions, you're usually thinking about the vestigial nucleus. If the patient has hypometric um, saccades in both directions, oftentimes you're thinking about the dorsal vermis. Here I'm asking the patient to make a downward saccade and he can almost, there's almost no downward saccade. The upward saccade's a little faster. This is the downward saccade and there's almost nothing there. So if saccades are slow or absent in all planes, think about something neurodegenerative like progressive supranuclear palsy. Um, if the saccades are slow and in a specific plane, think about something structural or ischemic. We talked on the first slide or one of the first slides about the burst neurons for vertical saccades. They live in the midbrain. Um, this is a, a vertical saccade palsy, so we don't care about the PPRF. This is a rostral interstitial medial longitudinal fasciculus problem. And in fact, this patient had a stroke um, involving the artery of Percheron where he had bilateral mesodiencephalic strokes that involved both RIMLFs, the right and the left. What about smooth pursuit? You need a small target, small fixation target. You need to move slowly. If you're moving too quickly, the patient's gonna need to catch up to the target using um, saccades. You don't wanna evaluate the saccades. You wanna isolate the smooth pursuit system. And again, it's important to perform this in all planes. This is the same patient who had the gaze of oak nystagmus from a couple slides ago. This is a target. Her head is fixed, not moving. And as she follows the target, you really see no smoothness. All it is are back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back saccades. That is because the pursuit system is so impaired, so damaged, that all she can do is use these saccades, basically, to follow the target. So they're very choppy. This is very choppy, impaired pursuit, um, also known as saccadic pursuit. When it's symmetrically saccadic, think about a, a cerebellar problem. In this case, she had a cerebellar degeneration or um, think about basal ganglia disorders like progressive supranuclear palsy. In PSP, the pursuit tends to be very saccadic. In Parkinson's disease, for instance, it's usually just a little saccadic, not that bad, um, but PSP, MSA, things like that, you're gonna see symmetrically um, ab abnormal pursuit. 
What about the vestibulo-ocular reflex suppression? This is a combined eye-head movement. And pursuit and VOR suppression are almost always both psychotic or both normal appearing. Um, VOR suppression basically is another way to evaluate the pursuit system. This is very nice in somebody who has a lot of um, vertical nystagmus, so a patient who has a cerebellopathy, who has spontaneous downbeat nystagmus. Sometimes because of the downbeat, it can be hard to judge whether pursuit is impaired, but if you have the patient um, hold out their thumb and do a combined eye-head movement, um, you can look for this horizontal corrective, these horizontal saccades, like I'll show you in the next slide, and it becomes much more apparent. So this is that same patient with the, the impaired pursuit. Now she's on a swivel chair. She's looking at her outstretched thumb, and she's just asked to keep looking at her thumb, and it's really choppy. So this is a, an example of psychotic VOR suppression. It's just as psychotic as smooth pursuit was. If smooth pursuit was as psychotic as it was in her, but VOR suppression looked really good, then you could automatically say, without even doing the head impulse test, that she has no VOR to suppress. So she has um, a loss of the vestibulo-ocular reflex. But in this case, it looks just as choppy, so you can say, without doing the head impulse test, that she has a, vis a VOR to suppress. She does not have bilateral vestibular loss. So again, the point here, the, if pursuit is psychotic, VOR suppression will be just as psychotic unless there's no VOR to suppress. This is an example of asymmetric pursuit. Asymmetrically psychotic. So to the right, it looks normal. To the left, it's really choppy. It's really psychotic. To the right, it looks normal. To the left, it's choppy. So this is asymmetric. This is not sort of a neurodegenerative problem. This implies that there's a lesion somewhere. VOR suppression, same thing. To the right is normal, and to the left is really choppy. So the right is normal, to the left is really choppy. So if you see this asymmetry, um, the problem is going to be ipsilateral to the side of the, the, the pursuit deficit. In his case, the pursuit deficit was to the left. And in fact, he suffered um, about uh, 20 years prior to this, um, a large left hemispheric stroke. Convergence. Convergence is a little bit less important for dizzy patients. Um, convergence in general, it's going to decrease a little bit as people age. It's going to be less with um, Parkinson's disease, Parkinsonism, head trauma. Um, the near point of convergence, that is the point at which one eye sort of pops out and the patient sees two of the target, it should be less than 10 centimeters. You need a small fixation target for this. This is a patient with PSP, progressive supranuclear palsy. You can see these square wave jerks, these psychotic intrusions, these back and forth. This is her fixating on a distant target and her ocular alignment is normal. Now she's looking at a near target. You see the left eye comes way in, the right eye comes way in, the left eye comes way in. This patient has um, convergence insufficiency. Here's a target coming toward her nose. And we're at about 20, 20 centimeters or so, the left eye sort of deviates outward. She sees two. She has convergence insufficiency, which again is very common in, in PSP or any form of Parkinsonism. This is an example of, um, of convergence um, provoking um, vertical nystagmus, in her case, upbeat nystagmus. So she's looking at a, a distant target. Now she's looking at her thumb. You see the upbeat come out with convergence. She's looking at a distant target, it goes away. Now she's looking at her thumb. You see this upbeat nystagmus. This patient, in fact, um, was a young woman who had a pilocytic astrocytoma affecting the posterior fossa, status post partial resection and radiation. So the, the pearl here is that it can increase or provoke acquired nystagmus, commonly vertical, that is upbeat or downbeat, um, or even cause it to transition. So somebody has upbeat nystagmus, you have them converge and now it's downbeat. Um, it's also going to damp congenital or infantile nystagmus. 
this is a true optokinetic um, full field visual stimulation, somebody looking out of a train. This will generate true optokinetic nystagmus. This is what we do at the bedside. So the slow phases are mainly pursuit, the fast phases are mainly saccades. This is not full field stimulation, but this is a nice handy way to assess for symmetry to make sure that the slow phases pursuit and the fast phases saccades are present. And this is an example of normal optokinetic nystagmus. This is an example of abnormal. So um, here the stimulus is to the left and this is normal. So this right beating nystagmus generated by the, the leftward um, OKN, now it's to the right and now there's no OKN. So if you have a problem um, generating optokinetic nystagmus in one direction, it's going to be ipsilateral. Let me just pause this. It's going to be ipsilateral to um, the side of the lesion. Um, the, the optokinetic nystagmus pathways originate in the parietal lobe. This patient had a right-sided parietal occipital lesion that caused a left homonymous hemianopia. And when the optokinetic stimulus went to the right side, this is to the left side, this is normal to the left side, normal to the left side, normal to the left side, and now drum to the right, and he can't generate any optokinetic nystagmus. This is due to his right parietal or ipsilateral parietal disease. So again, I like optokinetic nystagmus, this bedside test. It rapidly allows you to assess saccades pursuit. Um, you're gonna have a poor optokinetic response with slow saccades due to many neurodegenerative problems, including PSP, losing the downward fast phase um, to an optokinetic stimulus can be one of the first ocular motor signs of PSP. Um, and it's, not go it's going to be poor ipsilateral to a parietal lesion as in this case. This is a nice example of uh, an optokinetic uh, nystagmus sort of bringing out a left INO. This is normal. This is abnormal. You see this adducting lag of the left eye. See how slow this adducting saccade is in the left eye. Play that one more time. This is normal. Slow motion. This is normal. Normal op optokinetic nystagmus. And this is abnormal. See this disconjugacy, this adduction lag this slow adducting saccade. This implies a, a medial longitudinal fasciculus lesion um, causing a, an internuclear ophthalmoplegia, which this patient had. She had a left INO. Uh, this is a really nice way to, to quickly bring out a subtle INO as well. Take home points from the ocular motor portion. You really can't overlook the ocular motor exam. It's so important. Um, and if you know where these structures are in the brain stem of the cerebellum, and you know um, how to evaluate these eye movements, all each class of eye movements horizontally and vertically, um, it can really assist you with localization, localizing to a specific nucleus or nuclei um, in the posterior fossa and give you clues as to the etiology. All right, so number one is, is finished. Let me share number two here. All right, so this is the vestibular. Working like clockwork. Great, okay. I said it before, it was, definitely, it was my fault last time, I apologize. All right, um, so the vestibular exam, the vestibular system, we didn't get this far last time. <clears throat> Outline, basically we're gonna talk about um, three things. How do we evaluate the semicircular canals? How do we evaluate the utricles? And, and what are some central patterns that you should really be able to recognize? So semicircular canals, um, mainly we're talking about the vestibulo-ocular reflex here. That's what the semicircular canals do. They're the angular um, acceleration detectors. At the bedside, we can evaluate for these. We're gonna go through one by one. Uh, as far as laboratory evaluations, we're mainly thinking about or using video head impulse. The advantage of video head impulse is that it's quick and easy and well tolerated. You can not only evaluate the, the, the horizontal semicircular canal, 
um, but also the anterior and posterior semicircular canals, the vertical semicircular canals, whereas calorics and rotational chair testing are only going to evaluate function of the horizontal canal or primarily the horizontal canal. Um, and they're a little bit more invasive, a little bit more uncomfortable for patients. So this is the visually enhanced VOR, the VVOR. This is normal, this is the slow VOR. I'm just moving the head slowly. Um, this is two systems that I'm, that I'm using, that I'm assessing here. One is the pursuit system. So the, the pursuit system is a low frequency system. Um, so if this patient had bilateral vestibular loss, but a normal pursuit system, this should look perfectly normal. Um, and if the patient had um, completely normal vestibulo-ocular reflex, but impaired pursuit system, the patient could compensate for impaired pursuit with the intact VOR. The other thing to know is that if somebody has um, acute unilateral vestibular loss due to vestibular neuritis, for instance, the good side can actually drive the response if you're moving the head this slowly. So you really need to, to isolate the VOR, the vestibulo-ocular reflex. You really need to do a high frequency head impulse test, which we'll go into shortly. This is an example of a saccadic VVOR. This is in slow motion. Slow motion also always makes these subtle findings easier to see. And if, particularly as she goes through the middle, it's nothing but sort of saccade, 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 uh, this is not at all smooth. If you go too far, you start to see the gaze of oak nystagmus. You start to see the gaze of oak nystagmus. So you really care about sort of the center of the movement. Um, so this, without doing anything else, this saccadic VVOR implies that two systems are impaired and impaired to a significant degree. One is that the smooth pursuit system is impaired. The second is that the vestibulock, the reflex, is impaired. So by simply doing this, um, my suspicion is quite high for a condition like canvas. This patient had cerebellar degeneration and atrophy. This patient, in fact, did wind up having cerebellar ataxia, neuropathy, vestibular areflexia syndrome, also known as canvas. So when you see this saccadic VVOR, um, again, that tells you that both pursuit and the vestibulocular reflex systems are both impaired. They're both not working. So how do we really isolate the, the, the VOR? We do a head impulse. This is uh, David Z doing um, the world's best head impulse test on this normal patient who has a normal VOR. And again, it's a very um, sort of high frequency, low amplitude movement. And this is normal. Every movement, the eyes stay right on the target. This is a normal head impulse to the right and to the left. In this situation, the good side can't drive the response. So if the patient has an acute left vestibular neuritis, left um, peripheral vestibulopathy, the, the good side, the right side, won't be able to sort of compensate to take over for that. You will see this corrective saccade, this abnormal head impulse to the left, to the side of the lesion. This may be normal in Meniere's, which is important to know. While somebody might have significant caloric weakness on one side, um, at the bedside head impulse and also with video head impulse, it can look quite normal. This is an example of an abnormal head impulse. Um, bilaterally, much more significant to the left than to the right. And again, when the head is moved in either direction, the eyes go with the head. And then all of a sudden the patient realizes that the head or the, the eyes are off the target and there, there needs to be a corrective movement. Again, you can see that catch-up saccade, that corrective saccade, that's what we see at the bedside. And it's a little bit more significant to the left side in this case. You see that large, larger refixation saccade there. Um, and in this situation, this patient had bilateral vestibular loss. This is almost always peripheral, especially when it's bilateral. You're thinking about um, conditions like, uh, like bilateral vestibular loss from gentamicin, ototoxicity, uh, meningitis, bilateral meniere's, sequential vestibular neuritis. There are many conditions that can cause this, but it's pretty uncommon. Um, but when it does occur, it's almost always peripheral. But don't forget about patients who have vestibular loss due to a vestibular nucleus problem. For instance, um, these horizontal canal afferents, which start in the labyrinth, in the, in the ear, 
uh, immediately go into the vestibular nucleus and synapse on the medial vestibular nucleus. So in conditions like Wernicke's encephalopathy, which tends to affect midline structures like the MVN, patients with acute Wernicke's can have bilateral, um, ab bilaterally abnormal head impulse tests on a central basis. Don't forget about the cerebellar flocculus. The flocculus has a role in modulation of the VOR. Um, labyrinthine ischemia as well. A patient can have a, an ear stroke, a labyrinthine stroke that is peripheral, but it's a peripheral etiology or a peripheral localization due to a dangerous etiology that is a vascular one. TZBECL. Good, now shake This is dynamic visual acuity. The patient's looking at um, and what's the lowest a mirror in front of him. APE. OTS. That's projecting the eye chart vertically. T Z V E C L. And what just happened is first with with both eyes open, um, we asked the patient to read the lowest line he could see. He could see the 2020 line, um, and then the the examiner is going to move the head quickly, two to three hertz. T Z V E C L. Good. Now shake his and head he loses horizontally. One line. And what's the lowest line you can read now? He reads the 2025 -E line. Now, vertically. He reads the 2020 line. So normal people really shouldn't lose more than a line. One line is fine. Um, a distant chart, an eye chart at distance at 20 feet, for instance, uh, um, is preferable to a near card. The reason is because if the examiner is trying to shake the patient's head and also hold the near card, commonly you're, you're sort of moving the near card, making it more difficult for the patient. But if this patient who has oscillopsy or head movement dependent oscillopsia, um, where, who has bilateral vestibular loss, like the patient who I showed you, this is the symptom he would experience. If you have at the bedside bilaterally abnormal head impulse tests, this is the, the oscillopsy is the symptom. Um, dynamic visual acuity is much worse in that patient because again, you're assessing the vestibular ocular reflex but you're assessing sort of horizontally, both the right and the left side simultaneously. Vertically, you're assessing the anterior and posterior canals simultaneously right and left sides. So um, it's not, doesn't have as good localizing value, but it's much better than doing nothing. If a patient has bilateral vestibular loss, usually they're gonna lose four or more lines. Unilateral vestibular loss, usually in the order of two to three lines. So I'm gonna your head satisfied for about 10 seconds. This is head shaking. This is a provocative maneuver. It's nice to remove fixation in some way. Uh, these are infrared uh, sort of video frenzels. You're shaking the head for about 15 cycles at two to three hertz and looking for any um, head shaking induced nystagmus. This is a normal patient who didn't have any. Um, and if there's any vestibular asymmetry, this can bring it out. So even if a patient has had a vestibulopathy months ago or years ago, this can, can often bring out that asymmetry. This is an example. Here's a patient with Ramsey-Hunt syndrome on the left side, complete deafness on the left side, vestibulopathy on the left side, um, and shaking the head four months after his Ramsey-Hunt was still bringing on a pretty significant right beating nystagmus, which you'll see in slow motion in just a second here. So again, slow phase is going to go toward the side of the lesion, fast phase in the opposite direction. So this is a provocative maneuver to bring out any vestibular asymmetry. The only per acceptable peripheral pattern is that it's going to be contralesional as it was in this case. So a left-sided lesion, it's going to cause right beating nystagmus. Central patterns include vertical. So you, you shake the head horizontally and you see downbeat or upbeat or torsional, that's going to be central until proven otherwise. Or if you shake the head, you know that the patient's lesion is on the left side and the eyes um, beat to the left. Um, that, that's concerning in the acute setting that you're dealing with a central problem as well. Next thing is gonna be a little bit of vibration. This is a vibrator, you can buy it from, or this is 20, right 20 American dollars. You wanna vibrate the mastoid, you wanna vibrate the vertex. Um, as well as the opposite mastoid. You're looking to see if this induces any nystagmus. Um, vibrations transmitted symmetrically and bilaterally. This is, again, just another way to bring out vestibular asymmetry. This is a patient who suffered vestibular neuritis just a couple days ago on the left side. 
This is vibrator on. Good stop. Off. Decreases back to this mild right beating vibrator. Vibrate. On. And immediately, that right beating nystagmus increases. It's going to be time locked to um, the vibration. You can think of this as sort of an excitatory stimulus, um, like a, a warm water caloric, for instance. And again, um, the only sort of acceptable peripheral um, pattern is going to be that it's, it's contralesional. Like the other patient, this patient also had a left sided lesion, in this case, vestibular neuritis, just a couple days before. Um, so the slow phase is going to drift toward the paretic ear. The fast phase is going to be away. So left-sided lesion, right um, beating nystagmus brought on by vibration. Take big, deep breaths. This isn't mouth. really Pretty evaluating the vestibular ocular reflex, but it's a, a nice so bedside test to, to know about. To perform. 40 seconds, about one breath per second. Um, this is hyperventilation, it, which induces alkalosis and alters intra and extra cellu cellular calcium concentrations. It's particularly helpful in two conditions, vestibular paroxysmal and schwannoma. schwannoma. This patient Ring after 40 normally. seconds has this. <laughs> right beating torsional spontaneous or nystagmus that's provoked by the hyperventilation. It's beating towards the right ear. Um, this patient, in fact, did have a vestibular schwannoma. There was a couple of, of months of imbalance, right-sided hearing loss. The other condition to consider when there's significant hyperventilation-induced nystagmus is could there be neurovascular contact involving the eighth cranial nerve, something that we call vestibular paroxysmia. Um, so hyperventilation is, is a good test to know about. And, and usually in these conditions, it's going to bring on an excitatory or ipsy lesional nystagmus. So in this case, both of the lesions are right-sided and this patient's nystagmus was right beating, um, but, but um, inhibitory patterns also exist. So how do we examine the utricle? I've got about 20 minutes left. Um, so what are the what are the otoliths? What is the utricles? The otoliths are the linear acceleration detectors um, consisting of the utricle and the saccule. Mainly, we're just going to talk about the utricle. The bedside evaluation, the way that we evaluate the utricle function, um, are through the ocular alignment. We look at we can look at fundus torsion. We can evaluate subjective visual vertical. We are not going to talk about the laboratory evaluation, which mainly consists of vestibular evoked myogenic potentials. Um, which are particularly helpful in superior canal dehiscence syndrome, but not that helpful for most other conditions with some exceptions. So um, this is a, a representation of the physiologic ocular tilt reaction. This, this review article is about 25 pages of nothing but skew deviation. It's, it's great. Um, it's really hard to understand. When I was a neurology resident, I read it about 50 times and it made my head explode each time. And by the 51st time, it made perfect sense. And I've fallen in love with the OTR and, and skew deviation since that time. So think about yourself on a motorcycle. Think about yourself on a motorcycle going around a curve to the right. Um, by leaning into the turn, um, by leaning to the right, that's going to, to excite the right utricle. That's going to lead to uh, this physiologic ocular tilt reaction where the right eye is going to, um, going to elevate a little bit, the left eye is going to depress. In normal people who don't have any pathology, this, this skewing of the eyes is really, really minute. It makes up a very small part of the physiologic OTR. The other thing that's going to happen is that the eyes will roll, um, this ocular counter roll in the opposite direction. But in, in people um, like this motorcyclist, uh, the, the main component, the, the main um, form of compensation here is that people will um, have a reflexive reorientation of the head back to gravitational vertical. So you see that, that the patient's going around the curve to the right and he's able to straighten his head out. That's the, the main feature of the physiologic ocular tilt reaction. So this patient has the acute vestibular syndrome um, we're seeing the patient as it, in the hospital, and every time you un, the fellow or fellow un uncovers an eye, it comes in a little bit, it comes in a little bit, it comes in a little bit, 
it comes in a little bit. So there's a little bit of an exophoria, this exodeviation um, that we can see with alternate cover. It's a little bit of a horizontal movement. This is not a vertical movement. The point here is that many normal people have small horizontal deviations. This is a normal test of skew. There's no such thing as a horizontal skew. Um, if somebody's eyes are outward like this, that's called an exotropia. If somebody's eyes are inward, that's nesotropia. Neither of these is a skew. Again, there's no such thing as a horizontal skew. This patient has a big skew deviation. So the left eye comes up, right eye comes down, left eye comes up, right eye comes down, left eye comes up right eye comes way down. This is a big vertical ocular misalignment, um, which if you see this in an acutely dizzy or vertiginous patient, this is a positive test of skew, an abnormal test of skew. This is a skew deviation until proven otherwise, a skew. If you have access to a fundus camera, or if you can dilate the fundi and take a look, um, if you have double Maddox rods, for instance, these are other ways to evaluate fundus torsion. Um, here's the fovea, the, the center of the macula. This is where we see our best 20-20 vision. Here's the optic nerve, the cable connecting the eyeball to the brain. This is a normal angle between the fovea and the optic nerve. So you can measure this angle. You can quantify this angle with fundus photos. This is a patient who does not have normal fundus angles. Um, in fact, they are very rotated. This is a nice example of ocular counter roll. Um, in his case, he had a large left hyper. The left eye was higher. He had a big right head tilt and the eyes were counter rolled to the right. And this is un unfortunately a six year old boy who had a stroke that involved the interstitial nucleus of Cajal, um, which receives the, the utricle inputs in the midbrain. So if you have an INC lesion or a lesion anywhere along this utricle ocular motor pathway, you can have an ocular tilt reaction. This ocular counter roll that's seen clearly here um, is often one of the components of the ocular tilt reaction, also accompanied by skew deviation and head tilt, which this patient had, as, as well as subjective visual vertical tilt, which we'll talk about next. So what is the SVV? This is a, a very nice test um, called the bucket test. Here's sort of one of the first descriptions of it in, in neurology, the journal. And basically what you're doing is you're holding the bucket, you're, you're bringing the bucket towards the patient's head, you're putting the patient in the dark, the examiner's holding the bucket to eliminate any visual cues, any proprioceptive cues, and you're measuring the patient's perception of vertical to true earth vertical. So you can see on the outside, on the back of the bucket, um, with a weight and a protractor, what in fact is earth vertical and how many degrees is the patient off by. This is an easy bedside measurement of the SVV. Here's an example. This patient has an ocular tilt reaction with a big right head tilt, with a big ocular counter roll, I asked the patient if he's taken any photos recently since he had these, the, these neurologic deficits and he showed me a picture he took of his door where this is what he thinks is vertical. Clearly to us, this is tilted, this is not vertical. This is a, a, um, a representation of his altered SVV tilt. Patients who take pictures of the horizon who have an OTR, again, the horizon, everything will be tilted as well. Think of the SVV as sort of the fourth component of the OTR. It's a perceptual consequence of the OTR. The patient thinks that earth vertical is in the same direction as the head tilt as the ocular counter roll. It's also going to be abnormal, at least transiently, with a, a, a unilateral vestibular loss as in a vestibular neuritis. Um, but the degree of the tilt is much less with a peripheral lesion than it is with a central lesion. So here's the OTR. Number one is the head tilt. This is in a patient with a, a left Wallenberg, left lateral medullary stroke. Um, so you're going to see all the components of the OTR are going to be to the left side. Um, number one is a head tilt. So it's, there's a big left head tilt, again, toward the side of the lesion, toward the side of the stroke. Um, the right eye is going to be higher. The ocular counter roll is going to be in the same direction as the head tilt. 
and this is the same patient, um, what will that patient see? Um, the patient will see when you put the head in the bucket, this is from the patient's perspective, that the SVV, the subjective visual vertical, will also be significantly tilted to the left in the same direction as the head tilt, in the same direction as the ocular counter roll. So what if the utricle ocular motor pathways are affected symmetrically? Here, the right eye comes down. This is patients looking to the, to the right. Left eye comes up, right eye comes down. Left eye comes up, right eye comes down. Now the patient's going to look to the left. Left eye is going to come down. Right eye comes up, left eye comes down. Right eye comes up, left eye comes down. So this patient has two things. When she's looking to the left, the left eye is too high. When she looks to the right, the right eye is too high. Um, this is the kind of situation where I like to use the Maddox rod. I'm not, I don't have time to get into the Maddox rod. If you're interested in learning about the Maddox rod, again, this is something that costs about um, 30 American dollars. Forgot to mention, but the bucket test can be made um, at home. There are instructions online. Um, it, it, through the University of Pittsburgh, there's a PDF. You can make your own bucket, gives you instructions. But this Maddox rod, about 30 US dollars. Um, and this allows for a subjective um, quantification or qualification of um, ocular alignment, both vertically and horizontally. When a patient has a lot of nystagmus out to the sides, as in this case, when she looked out to the left, she has a lot of left beating nystagmus. When she looks to the right, she had a lot of right beating nystagmus. Sometimes it can be hard to measure strabismus, measure ocular alignment when there's a lot of jumping and jiggling. Um, so this is a nice subjective way to do that, but the patient has to be cooperative. Here, even when she's looking to the right, she's, she has gaze of oak nystagmus, the video is Paul's, but when she's looking to the right, you can see that the right eye is higher than the left eye. The left eye is sort of going down a little bit, the right eye is going up a little bit. So an alternating skew deviation, you can think of this as a utricle imbalance in the pitch plane, as opposed to an ocular tilt reaction is an asymmetric utricle injury in the roll plane. Um, is a common occurrence in a patient, if you look hard enough, a common occurrence in a patient with a, a flocculus, paraflocculus syndrome who has downbeat nystagmus or saccadic pursuit or gaze of oak nystagmus. And again, I really like the Maddox rod for these kinds of patients. What if the utricle pathways are stimulated? This is a rare case of something called paroxysmal ocular tilt reaction where um, with sort of some rhythmicity, the left or the head, head is going to tilt to the left a little bit, the right eye goes up, the left eye comes down just a little bit, and the both eyes counter roll in the same direction. Um, this is almost always due to an irritative region, um, lesion involving the INC, the interstitial nucleus of Cajal. I showed you the case of a stroke involving the INC. Um, in that situation, everything will be away from the lesion and it'll be static. So that patient had a left INC stroke. So the patient um, had a right head tilt, counter roll toward the right ear um, as well. So, and a skew with a, a, the left eye being higher. In this case, because this is an irritative problem, um, oftentimes because of the hemosiderin products, which can be irritative, the, the OTR, the, the excitatory OTR is going to be in the opposite direction as uh, the, the pathologic ocular tilt reaction. So a few central patterns in the last couple of minutes, things to recognize, things to look for. Um, when you perform some of these provocative maneuvers, um, some of which we went over today, some of which um, presumably have been um, gone over in the last couple of weeks with regard to Dick's Hall Pike and positional vertigo. So this is head shaking. This patient has no vestibular loss. His head impulse testing was perfect. His video head impulse testing was perfect. You perform horizontal head shaking and you see this really robust left beating nystagmus. This is a central pattern. If you see significant head shaking nystagmus in the opposite or in the, um, in the absence of any VOR problem, you're thinking about something central. In this case, he was actually shot in his cerebellum, um, which sort of um, significantly injured the nodulus, the uvula. That explains this sort of loss of velocity storage. 
and this central pattern of head shaking nystagmus. Um, because of the nodulous injury, he actually had periodic alternating nystagmus immediately after the injury, which was which gone, went away completely with baclofen. So the PAN, the periodic alternating nystagmus, went away completely, but he was still left with this um, central pattern of head shaking nystagmus. Also, if you shake the head horizontally, and like I said before, the eyes move vertically upbeat, usually downbeat in different cerebellar conditions, that's a central pattern. Also, if it's ipsy lesional, so the patient has a left-sided lesion, you shake the head and you see left beating nystagmus acutely, that's another central pattern. Keep going, good, five, four, three, two, one, good. Eyes open, breathe normally. This patient had a little bit of gaze evoke nystagmus um, out to the side, some psychotic pursuit, but no downbeat until you hyperventilate her. This patient has a cerebellar degeneration, cerebellar atrophy, and it's important to know that downbeat is common with cerebellar disorders um, or hyperventilation-induced downbeat nystagmus. It's thought to be due to the sensitivity of the cerebellar calcium channels. This patient, regardless of whether I performed a right dick salt bike or left dick salt bike or went straight back, as I did in this situation, there's no latency. This, this pure downbeat nystagmus doesn't fatigue. It just stays for as long as she's in this position. This is very atypical for benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Um, here's what the labyrinth looks like. You can technically get downbeat nystagmus from anterior canal benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, but it should behave like posterior canal or horizontal canal. It should be, there should be a latency. It should fatigue. There should be sort of a crescendo decrescendo um, pattern to it, none of which were present in this case. This is not a case of anterior canal BPPV. This patient also had some gaze of oak nystagmus. Um, she had some psychotic pursuit and also had a cerebellar degeneration. So if you see positional downbeat nystagmus, this should be assumed to, to be central until proven otherwise. It's rarely going to be anterior canal BPPV, mainly because it's just hard to get otoconia to get the rocks into the anterior canal. Um, given its orientation relative to gravity. This patient is in the right roll, right supine roll position with the right ear down and has left beating nystagmus. This is apogeotropic nystagmus. And when the left ear is down, um, the nystagmus is going to also be apogeotropic. So left ear down, um, right now, he's just in a supine position. Now his left ear is down towards the ground. This is a left roll test. And now there's right beating nystagmus. So it changed direction, but it's still beating toward the sky. So this is still apogeotropic. It's much stronger. So if this is horizontal canal BBBV, which it was, um, the, the strongest nystagmus, when you see the strongest nystagmus, it's going to beat toward the side of the, of the lesion, the problem. Um, so in this case, he had right um, apogeotropic variant of horizontal canal BPPV. But sometimes patients with apogeotropic nystagmus don't have horizontal canal BPPV. Sometimes they have a, a midline um, structural problem like a tumor or like a stroke, for instance, usually involving the nodulus and uvula. Um, geotropic nystagmus is rarely central, but remember that apogeotropic can be central. So if you see a patient with apogeotropic nystagmus that, that you can't treat even with um, repeated properly performed repositioning maneuvers, it doesn't change, or you can't convert that apogeotropic to geotropic, then you should be concerned that this could be a neurologic problem and you should order neuroimaging. This patient has a little bit of spontaneous downbeat nystagmus. The infrared, the video oculography system is monocular. This is just the right eye. But then you put the head down into a prone position. You don't have to have the patient lie on their belly necessarily. You can have them lean forward so that the head is between their legs. And this is often what you'll find, that that little bit of downbeat turns into a lot of downbeat. 
where a patient might have just a little bit of gaze of open nystagmus or a little bit of um, psychotic pursuit, but no spontaneous downbeat. You put them into a prone position and they have, a, they have significant downbeat or clear downbeat. Um, you can sort of rest assured that you are dealing with a central problem. So try out prone positioning in your clinics. Without goggles, it can be a little difficult to see the patient's eyes. You might need to get down on your knees. Um, but it's, it's doable. All right, so take home points. So the vestibular exam is best performed with fixation removed. You just saw that um, these infrared video oculography goggles, you saw a pair of video Frenzels earlier in the presentation. You also saw some Frenzel goggles. These Frenzel goggles are plus 20, plus 30 diopter lenses that magnify the eyes quite a bit. The patient really can't see out of them um, because they're so high powered. Uh, there's also illumination so that the examiner can see the patients well. All of these, these forms of um, ways of removing fixation are going to make that nystagmus even more prominent and easier to, to uh, appreciate. With a good history, ocular motor exam and a vestibular exam, the diagnosis can really almost always be made. And you really don't need a lot of fancy testing for most of these patients. Um, if, you, if you took the time to take a good history and a good exam. And the laboratory testing is really going to confirm the diagnosis for you. So again, um, all of these videos either are or some of them I, I've just submitted to my collection, they will be there soon, um, but lots and lots of videos, educational content in my collection. Here's my email address if there's anything I can, I can help with. And um, thanks so much for your time and attention. Thank you, Daniel. That was perfect. Uh, you want to take the questions? Dr. Lakshmi? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Hi, sir. Wonderful law lecture, Dr. Daniel. Thank you. And, uh, and really, we, really, we enjoyed the talk. And uh, now, uh, is there, um, uh, so there are, we have questions on, on the session now. Yeah. Are you so, going to take that uh, now? Yeah. Uh, do you see the question? You, if you click on the Q and A, no, you will see the question. So. Uh, yeah, I am seeing. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I am yeah. And uh, somebody asked, please explain VOR suppression. VOR suppression. Um, so. Yeah. VOR suppression is required under under daily circumstances. So think about yourself um, walking down the grocery store aisle and trying to move your head while you're also trying to, to read something that's stationary. You're using two systems. By moving your head, you're initiating the vestibular ocular reflex. Um, by looking at whatever it is that you're looking at, you're, you need to use the, the smooth pursuit system as well, for instance. Or think about yourself on a bus, you're reading, um, you, you need to fixate on whatever it is that you're looking at and the bus is turning. That's stimulating the vestibular ocular reflex. So there are, there are times in daily life when you must turn off the VOR uh, because it's, it can impede, it can impact in a negative way your ability to fixate on something that you want to look at. So there has to be a way to turn off the vestibular ocular reflex. Um, and some people can't do that. Patients who have complete absence of, of the vestibular ocular, um, I'm sorry, complete absence of the pursuit system, for instance, um, but have an intact VOR, like a, a patient with um, with progressive supranuclear palsy, um, might not be able to, to suppress the VOR at all, but the VOR might work. That's an example where um, if the patient's head is moved to one side, the eyes will just drift to the opposite side in accordance with the VOR without the pursuit system working. So the, pers the VOR suppression system is basically another way, another manifestation of the pursuit system working that allows you to fixate during daily activities, during daily life uh, under some circumstances. Uh, I, I, when you turn your head to the right, 
your eyes are normally going to gradually turn the same degree to the left to the other side but when you do to do that in the example that uh, i didn't told you then you suppress your 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 is wanting your eyes to the left but you don't want to so daniel why do you know how you check it right so a nice way to check it if you have a swivel chair um, a swivel chair is a really nice way to check VOR suppression. You just have the patient look at their thumb and then you just swivel the chair. Again, it's a combined eye head movement like this. Um, the other way that you can do it is just simply to, to move the target with the patient's head as I showed in one of the videos. But it's a combined eye head movement. If you have a swivel chair, if you're just moving, making sure to move the head and the target together, the eyes shouldn't move at all. They should be nice and steady. Sometimes uh, uh, you are can be easier to look for the nystagmus than uh, trying to make out is the person a little puppy. So uh, you can either look at the person or you can see if uh, you are suppressed. Can, can, I, can I share a, another video that I have? Sure, sure. Um, so this is an example of a, a patient who has PSP who has absolutely no um, VOR suppression. So what happens if you have no VOR suppression? Good. Look right at the light of the camera. Move your eyes up towards the ceiling. So this patient Good. try has to move your eyes down towards the floor. Horizontal. Look down. Ophthalmoplegia. And now I want you to look very to the right. Advanced, progressive supranuclear palsy. Good. Can't Just look try to, to move right, your eyes to the right. To left. But if I move the head, the vestibular right ocular the reflex still works. Right that at the can light. overcome the deficits. Right at the light. And now I have her right in, the a, light. in a swivel chair. Right at the light. Look right at the light of the camera. So she's looking at the Good. target. She has look no right at the VOR light of the camera. suppression. Her VOR works but she can't turn Look off right the, the, light of the camera. Off. So this is what would happen if you couldn't Look suppress right the, light of the camera. VOR. Your eyes would just move with the VOR in one direction. So you wouldn't want this to happen if you were um, performing certain tasks, like again, moving your head while in the grocery store and trying to look at, at the ingredient labels. Um, this wouldn't work very well. So hopefully that's highlighted the importance of, of VOR suppression. What happens when it's completely gone? Same thing again. VOR suppression tests normal in patients of vestibulopathy as there is no VOR to suppress. You have absent VOR on vestibulopathy or impaired VOR. VOR suppression. Right. So if somebody has just from a, a unilateral vestibular standpoint, so um, if you have a unilateral vestibular loss, so if you have a, a right-sided vestibular neuritis, your pursuit system should work normally. Because your pursuit system is working normally, your VOR suppression should be normal. But if somebody has a cerebellar problem, um, so that they have very psychotic pursuit at baseline, and then all of a sudden they have right vestibular neuritis, then, then their pursuit will be choppy to the right and the left, but because they have no VOR to suppress to the right, when they do VOR suppression to the left, it will be choppy, just as choppy as it would be with, with pursuit. And when they move the head to the right, to the side of the vestibular neuritis, it will look much better. That asymmetry will be the, the, a consequence of this, um, the fact that there's no VOR to suppress on the right, and there is a VOR to suppress on the left. But otherwise, uh, if, if somebody has an intact cerebellum um, and they have a unilateral vestibular loss, vestibular neuritis, that shouldn't impact the VOR suppression or the pursuit systems. Right, right. Uh, when you talk to the patient when you are performing the optokinetic nystagmus with a tape. Uh, when you have a drum, it is easier because the screen is much bigger. When you just have a tape, uh, taking the okay and sorry, I missed I missed the last sentence. So uh, uh, many times in our clinic we do not have a uh, optokinetic uh, drum. People do a, a 
take a tape and just drag the tape along, a measuring tape, and they drag it along. So what do you? Yep. You tell him to look at the numbers. What exactly? Right. So you don't want um, spacing. The thing I don't like about the drum is that the lines are spaced very close to one another. Um, I like the the optokinetic flag that I showed in the videos because the the, the squares are a little bit farther apart. So if you're using measuring tape, you just want to make sure that you're not having them look every inch. You're having them look every five inches or so. Um, that's how you'll really be able to, to evaluate the optokinetic nystagmus, the slow phase, and the fast phase. Flag is interesting. It's made, a, it's made of paper, not. I'm sorry. It's made of paper. The the uh, the flag uh, optokinetic flag it is made of what? Uh, that's that's made of cloth. My my mother in law made that for me. <laughs> okay. So I I made the bucket. She made the optokinetic flag. Okay. <laughs> you want to ask next question? Uh, yeah, one more question. Uh, how can the hip be normal in many years disease? The question is so, from uh, Naveen. Right. So there are when different theories. Be normal in many years. Right. So there are different theories for why that might be. Probably the most accepted theory is that um, if you have Meniere's, it's going to affect the vestibular ocular reflex at the lower frequencies. And the lower frequencies are much better avowed by, evaluated by the caloric tests. Um, as are the high frequencies, which are much better evaluated by the head impulse tests. If you have a vestibular neuritis, you're going to affect um, the, the low frequencies, the middle frequencies, and the higher frequencies. Whereas if you affect Meniere or have Meniere's, oftentimes you're, you're primarily going to affect the lower frequency VOR. So because the calorics evaluate the low frequency VOR because the head impulse, the video head impulse assesses the high frequency VOR. Um, that's one possible reason for the dissociation between the two. Okay, thank you. There's one more, yeah. one more question which I want to uh, uh, What is meant by visually enhanced in VVOR? What do you mean by the visually enhanced, the word visually enhanced in a VVOR? Right. So, so this, this is the vestibular ocular reflex. Um, the fact that, that I'm saying visually enhanced is because I'm also using my smooth pursuit system. I'm also using these visual systems um, to keep my eyes on the target. When you're doing a, a head impulse where the head is moved very quickly, these visually um, sort of guided pathways like the smooth pursuit system fail. They don't work as well. Um, and so by doing the head impulse, you're taking these low frequency systems out of the equation and you're isolating the, the head impulse. But when you're doing a slow VOR, you are enhancing that response with the visual system, with the smooth pursuit system. Um, uh, would you like to... Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Have, uh, uh, many people do not have a video pretzel or even a pretzel. So can you tell about the... Poor man's way of um, the cutting out vision. So, right. Um, so other other things you can do um, is you can put a, a magnifying glass. You can use a magnifying glass. Cover one eye. Magnifying glass over this eye. Bright light that sort of um, gives some of that magnification, like the Frenzels. And because you can't see as well out of the magnifying glass, you're gonna remove fixation to some degree. Um, Dr. David Newman Choker has sort of written about this pen light cover test, where the same kind of thing, you cover one eye, you shine a bright light at the other eye. Um, the, the light is so bright that you're sort of removing some of the, the ability for the patient to fixate. So that's called the pen light cover test. That's another way to partially um, eliminate fixation. Another really nice way at the bedside that you can eliminate fixation is by covering one eye or have the patient cover one eye and then just use the ophthalmoscope. Um, and by visualizing the, the optic nerve, um, you, will, you will be able to see 
if it's jumping vertically or horizontally, it can be a little bit more challenging when you're doing some of these provocative maneuvers, though, if you're using the ophthalmoscope. Um, but the pen light cover test works quite well. Um, you're going to see the nystagmus that, that's pretty significant. All the examples that I showed, you'll be able to see that well with any of these, any of these mechanisms. Um, and, but some of the subtle cases you, you might not see as well without using the Frenzels or the, the video Frenzels. Um, sometimes I have tried taking just a blank sheet of paper and putting it in mm -hmm. front of the patient's eyes and uh, it might pick up. Uh, and with the fundoscope, you have to cover the left eye. I mean, the eye. You have to cover it internally. Right. So the person has to fixate somewhere else. Correct. So, so actually, I, I like using a, the panoptic ophthalmoscope. Um, in patients, in dizzy patients, because that allows you to really manipulate the head. You see a wider view of the optic nerve. So even if I'm shaking the head while I'm looking at the nerve, it, it allows me to continue to visualize the nerve better than, than the direct ophthalmoscope, which has just a smaller view. Um, I, the, the, if you put a, a white featureless piece of paper in front of the patient, as you said, you're removing fixation. If the patient has absolutely nothing to fixate on, um, but you have to make sure that white piece of paper is completely featureless. Not to um, but, right. But sometimes it can be, if you have a big sheet of paper in front of the patient's eyes, it can be hard to see the eye movements as well. Uh, do you have time for one more question? Dr. Sure. Dr. Lan? Yep. Do you have one more time for one more question? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, I, hello? Hello, uh, David, uh, I mean, um, Daniel? Yep, I'm here. Yes, so I don't know what has happened to uh, Lakshmi. So he's asked, uh, how much time should you uh, ask a patient, uh, Dr. Parsala asked, how much time should you ask the patient to hyperventilate to provoke the nystagmus? Yeah, usually in the range of 40 seconds or so. Um, if, it's, if, if they really have some pathology, then you're, you're going to bring it out before 40 seconds. But 40 good seconds of, of hyperventilation um, is really going to bring out even the, the subtle findings if somebody has some cerebellopathy or um, has some neurovascular contact. But, but the, the examples that I showed, the one patient who had the significant downbeat, um, it, hyperventilation induced downbeat nystagmus, I mean, that, that was quite apparent after just 10 or 20 seconds. That patient with the vestibular schwannoma, again, um, it didn't, didn't take 40 seconds to see that. Okay, I think we'll take the last question because there are lots. Uh, Dr. Santosh asks, do you need an MRI in every apogeotropic horizontal canal BPP? So if you're not comfortable um, treating that patient or if you don't have a therapist or somebody who can treat that patient, see them pretty quickly, and, and if, if that person who's knowledgeable and sees a lot of patients with positional vertigo and positional nystagmus cannot... Um, resolve that apogeotropic nystagmus, then absolutely. Um, if you're just uncomfortable, if there are red flags, if you see some, some gaze evoked nystagmus and apogeotropic, absolutely just get the MRI. Um, but it, it depends on your comfort level. If you are uncomfortable and it's apogeotropic, just get a scan. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll repeat what Dr. Daniel has said. If you have an apogeotropic lateral canal BPPV, and you do a repositioning maneuver and it changes into geotropic or it gets resolved, you don't do an MRI, then it is BPPV. But if it just remains the same way, it just remains like a hypogeotropic and it is not disappearing with whatever maneuvers you or your therapist is doing, then yes, you should get an MRI done. Okay, Daniel, that was excellent.